Now on KGW News, this baby boy couldn't wait to meet his sister. Oh my God, he's coming up. Okay, I need your help. The brave 11-year-old delivered her brother when mom went into labor at home. By the grace of God, everything was perfect. A Portland woman watches years of hard work go up in flames. I, I mean, I'm, I was just crying and screaming in my car. But now the community she's worked to serve is returning the kindness. This is essentially your warning. COVID cases keep rising. Now another partial shutdown is looming. Plus, the way that he ended up leaving this world is just, you know, egregious. A grieving family calls for Portland police to be held accountable for killing their loved one. We begin with the developing story out of Northwest Portland tonight. Police have declared a riot after vandals marching in the street broke windows at a Starbucks and spray painted graffiti in several spots. This was around 23rd and Hoyt tonight. Police say most of the crowd has moved out of the area now. One person has been arrested. The group marching says they're calling for justice over deadly police shootings. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Laurel Porter. Today, Portland's mayor also called on community members to stand up to violence and intimidation from what he called the self-described anarchist mob. Ted Wheeler announced he was extending the state of emergency through the weekend following several nights where the city saw this group breaking windows. The mayor told people to watch for people in black clothing getting out of their cars at planned direct action events, to call police and record their license plates. He also asked people to take photos if they see destruction happening and call people out who were doing the damage. The city is beginning to recover, but self-described anarchists who engage in regular criminal destruction don't want things to open up, to recover. They want to prevent us from doing the work of making a better Portland for everyone. The state of emergency will remain in effect through noon on Monday. It allows the mayor to declare a curfew, close streets and other public facilities. This comes one week after Portland police shot and killed a man in Lens Park. Family and supporters turned out for a vigil for Robert Delgado at the park tonight. Even though this tragedy happened, I do have to say that Robert is at his best right now, shining down because of all of you. Delgado's family also spoke with reporters earlier today. They say Delgado was in a mental health crisis at the time he was shot, and he should have been treated differently. Dan Haggerty has more from them tonight. And above all, you know, he was a human, regardless of his situation at the present time. That doesn't make him any less human. Um. Robert Delgado's children and siblings lined up for the cameras Friday to show that he had family who loved him. And his young niece explained this. They don't think police should have killed him. And I don't think they had have a right to do that to someone. Anyone. Some quick background for you on this case. Police were called to Lentz Park on the report of a man waving a gun around. From dispatch audio, we know that the first officer to get there said that Delgado was, quote, non-compliant. He said Delgado's hands were empty at the time. Another officer said he believed the gun was in Delgado's back pocket. Witness video shows part of that confrontation with Delgado throwing a tent, then walking back to a tree. Now, just four minutes after police got to the park, officers shot him from about 90 feet away. Police say they later found a replica gun at the scene. But what we don't know still to this point is where that gun was at the time police shot Delgado. The family attorney says his killing, in their opinion, is just the latest example of Portland police mishandling someone in a mental health crisis. But what we have seen from the videos and from witness statements is, is deeply disturbing and alarming. Um, we see that Robert is clearly having a mental health crisis. He's clearly ha struggling with um, to keep his composure. Um, and we hear the way that the police were responding and directing orders at Robert in the moments when he was in crisis. Now, it's not just them saying that PPB has a problem. The attorney brought up an investigation that we've been talking a lot about on the story at 6 o'clock. See, the DOJ started investigating PPB's use of force and pattern of killing people with mental illnesses 10 years ago. 
They found the Bureau had deficiencies in policy, training, and officer accountability. The city agreed to address those issues, but when the DOJ checked in, it found the Bureau wasn't fully complying. Fast forward to last month and the DOJ sent a letter to the city saying they had to make some changes or the federal government could begin the process of actually taking over the police bureau. Now we're still trying to get some answers from the city on exactly what their next move is going to be. I've been told that they are going to respond to that letter by the beginning of next month. As for the Delgado family. And I just want there to be change made before another family has to experience this. They're not relying on the city to handle their case. They're now calling for Oregon's governor and the state attorney general to appoint a special prosecutor to do an independent investigation. In the pandemic now, U.S. health officials have lifted an 11-day pause on Johnson & Johnson's COVID vaccine. A panel of experts recommended the change today. The vaccine was stopped because there have been 15 cases of rare but potentially deadly blood clots. Despite that, the experts say the benefits outweigh the risks and will add a warning to the vaccine. An Oregon woman died shortly after getting her shot, though officials are still investigating whether the vaccine contributed to her death. Oregon is also finishing its own review of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, along with other western states, before it will start distributing it again. Meantime, COVID cases are surging in Oregon and Oregon Governor Kate Brown said she may have to tighten restrictions again. At least 12 counties could move back to extreme risk soon. That would ban indoor dining and severely limit the number of people who can gather indoors at other businesses. The change would start April 30th, though we don't know yet which counties may be affected. The state is still reviewing the data. This is essentially your warning. Um, should cases continue to rise and sh should we reach capacity in our hospital systems, there will be several counties moving into extreme risk uh, next week. Oregon is essentially in a race to vaccinate people while this new surge is happening. The governor said if enough Oregonians get the vaccine, the state could end most COVID restrictions by the end of June. But the coming weeks will be crucial to make that happen. It has been a long and devastating week for one Portland business. Fire destroyed the Portland Garment Factory in southeast Portland. Investigators say it was arson. Catherine Cook talked with the owner about her loss and the outpouring of support from the community. Once in a while, if you're lucky, you feel how Britt Howard felt last Friday about her work. I went home and I said, I'm, I'm feeling so creative and I'm feeling so in, alive and actually proud of myself. Howard owns Portland Garment Factory in Southeast Portland's Montevilla neighborhood. They produce clothing and soft goods. Something is happening. Something is about to change. And I actually said those words. That change came early Monday morning. It was not what she expected. Woke up to a call at 5 a.m. that my building was on fire and it was just like a complete nightmare. On her way there, Howard could see the flames rising from miles away. 13 years of work and a lifetime of dreams up in smoke. I, w I mean, I'm, I was just crying and screaming in my car. I almost threw up when I saw it. The building was a total loss. Investigators ruled it arson. Surveillance video shows the suspect and the fire starting in a nearby dumpster before spreading to Howard's business. I know that they are a person with mental health issues and that's something that needs to be addressed in the city urgently. It's, bur it's burned down my business. I insurance companies aren't insuring businesses the way they were in Portland before. It's not without compassion that Howard shares those words. Compassion, community, and giving back are cornerstones of her business. Portland Garment Factory was one of the first businesses to mass produce and donate face masks. Over the years, they've made countless coats and blankets for donation drives. In that spirit, Howard's friends insisted on opening a GoFundMe account to help. Money raised will help Howard and her employees relocate. It could have been me. Yarek Shemansky owns Threshold Brewing and Blending across the street. His is one of several Monteville businesses that donated a portion of their sales this week to Howard. Everybody knows each other and people have been trying to help each other as well whenever they can. I don't even know what I can think about it. This was a terrible act. 
By Friday, their GoFundMe account had raised nearly $100,000. It's hard to talk about without getting emotional. Just, I had someone write on my Instagram that this isn't about taking. You're not taking from people. Taking is different. Taking is what the person did who lit this fire. And that was really actually a super helpful way to think of it for me because I love to be a giver and I love the community so m very much. A world away from the premonitions she had last Friday, but still wrapped in gratitude. It's inspiring to say the very least. Catherine Cook, KGW News. Such